Good evening, everyone. If I could have everyone take a seat, we'll get started. Oh, thanks. That would be good. <laughs> thanks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jennifer Winters, the director of Bing Nursery School, and it's certainly my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mike Frank for tonight's distinguished lecture. Dr. Michael Frank is a David and Lucille Packard Professor of Human Biology in the Department of Psychology. He actually is also a member of our advisory board, which we're very happy about. <laughs> he earned his BA and BS from Stanford in 20, uh, 2004 and his PhD from MIT in 2010. His research lies at the intersection of social cognition and language, asking how do children figure out how language works and how do they grasp the, grasp the rudiments of language from an early age. Frank seeks to understand how the social context of interactions between children and caregivers both facilitate establishing a link between word and meaning and help children learn how the words go together in sentences. Professor Frank is the organizer of the Many Baby Consortium, a collaborative replication network for infancy research, and has led open data projects including WordBank and MetaLab. WordBank is an open database of children's vocabulary growth, featuring data from contributors from around the world. Professor Frank has been recognized by the Association for Psychological Science as a rising star. His dissertation received the Glus the Glusko Prize for the Cognitive Science from the excuse me the Cognitive Science Society, and he is a recipient of the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences Early Career Impact Award and a Jacobs Foundation Advanced Research Fellowship. He has served as an associate editor for the journal editor for the journal Cognition, chair of the governing board of the Cognitive Science Society, and was a founding member of the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science. Professor Frank's book, Variability and Consistency in Early Language Learning, the Word Bank Project, will be published by MIT Press. In his talk today, Professor Frank will explore how large data sets are revealing the importance of children's social environment and suggesting new commonalities in language learning across very different languages. So let's give a warm applause for Dr. Frank. Thanks so much for the warm introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. I love being here at Bing. It's such a, a wonderful environment for kids and a wonderful environment for researchers also. So uh, in the next few minutes, I want to share with you some of the work that I've been doing with my collaborators over the last couple of years to try to move to using larger data sets representing uh, a larger number of languages and children to really explore children's language learning at scale. So language learning is one of the key scientific puzzles for cognitive science and psychology. This transformation from speechless, wordless infant to just a few years later, toddlers and preschoolers who may not be perfect at using language, but they know how to use language to make their way through the world and interact with other people, that's just an incredible transition. And every typically developing child makes that transition. How does that le learning happen? Well, one thing we know is that language explodes onto the scene. Uh, so here's my daughter, Madeline. Uh, this is her at 18 months. She's ready to go out. Uh, she's in her pajamas, and she's got her purse and a, a, a sack lunch packed. Uh, and so uh, this won't be the last picture of her, by the way. Uh, so uh, at 18 months, the longest thing she'd ever said was happy B for happy birthday. Uh, and then at 19 months, she combined words for the first time. This is like a psycholinguist dad made proud. Uh, so she says blue ball. At 20 months, she says move back. 21 months, bye-bye, other pirate. Uh, I could tell you the story about the pirate ship at golf course. Um, uh, 22 months, uh, dump it, my. She's asking, can I dump the cereal on the ground? And of course, we say, no, please don't, which she doesn't listen to. Uh, 23 months, she observes that spike doggy, no food, eat dirt. This is my mother-in-law's chihuahua, and it's true that he doesn't eat food, he eats dirt. <laughs> at 24 months, my like, no, this passy, so getting rid of the pacifier, at least temporarily. Uh, at 25 months, that too big, my too bigger. 
And at 26 months, she's a teenager already, and she says, Dada, move own body. Might need a little bit more space. <laughs> so here she is at 26 months. Uh, she's maybe a pound or two heavier. Her hair is longer, and she's got a bunch more dirt on her face. Uh, but these physical changes pale in comparison to what's happened in terms of her expressive ability. She's gone from a kid who really couldn't express complex thoughts using language to one who can. And I know one way she didn't do this. She didn't do it by imitating me. Right? I never said any of this stuff. <laughs> so there's some generalization happening here. And that generalization is the heart of the puzzle. And this is a puzzle that puzzles cognitive scientists, and it also puzzles people in artificial intelligence and technology. Right? So the kinds of generalizations that Madeline was making in those sentences are critical for developing language processing algorithms that learn like human children, that make good use of data, that learn quickly, and learn to not just interpret what's being said, but move to what is being meant by those messages. And we interact with those language processing algorithms on an increasingly frequent basis. And sometimes they really don't understand what's being meant. Right? So developing a better understanding of children's language learning and its flexibility and generalization is a key priority in artificial intelligence and technology. And yet, when I turn to the literature in developmental psychology, what I see in terms of a theoretical framework is disappointing. Um, so the way I was taught about language development, and in some, sense, some cases, the way I teach about language development doesn't help fuel that technological development that I'm hoping. That's because our theories are really very much based on what I'd call an ages and stages type of model. I'm sure you've seen this kind of thing in baby books and parent books. You see the four stages of language development. Before you talk, babbling, uh, one word utterances, and combining words. And that's not a bad description of the data. And in fact, in scientific papers, you get more detailed timelines that are slightly better descriptions of the data. But fundamentally, even the most detailed of these don't really give you a good flavor for why the kinds of generalizations that we see in early language are happening and how they vary across individuals. In some sense, what we're looking at in those ages and stages charts is a schematic child. This is a child whose vocabulary um, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, the number of words they know, that vocabulary is increasing over time. But that's kind of all we know about this kid. Unfortunately, when we look in the data, they're a lot messier than that one schematic curve. These are the kind of data that we're going to be grappling with, data from hundreds or thousands of kids. And they're all over the place. They're not just following that one same schematic curve, going through the milestones and ticking them off. Maybe you've noticed this when you compare your own child to the schematic in the baby book. In some sense, what we're seeing is a lot of different trajectories into language, that kids take many different routes into language. And what I'm interested in is both what's variable across these different ways that la children acquire language, and also what's consistent. That tension between variability, the differences between kids, and the differences between kids learning different languages on the one hand, and the consistency, the things that nearly every kid does and that happen in nearly every language, that tension is going to be what we try to learn about today. I also want to mention that our ages and stages view that doesn't acknowledge this kind of variability or doesn't try to measure it or describe it is also a lost opportunity. Research here at Stanford and in other places, including some influential work by my mentor and colleague, Anne Frenald, has shown that early language is a very important part of later school outcomes. And early language, in fact, is one of the first places that you see socioeconomic differences manifesting themselves between kids. So this is the now famous study that uh, suggested a 30 million word gap between uh, those children growing up in high socioeconomic status homes and those children growing up in low SES homes. So uh, what I'm showing here is the cumulative vocabulary learned by those kids. And already at 18 months, a year and a half, uh, this work and subsequent work by Anne Fernald shows that those socioeconomic differences are starting to show up. That's important because when kids with smaller vocabularies go to school, they tend to have a hard time learning to read. It tends to impede their academic success. And you see a cascading effect of differences in early language. So the kind of basic research that I'm doing hopefully feeds back into a better understanding of these different pathways into language and where the right place is to intervene and change things. So because of this issue of not having the right theories, I've come to the conclusion over the last couple of years that we simply needed more data. So 
I went out to try to find those data. And the story that I want to tell you today is about the story of finding those data and trying to explore them and think about what generalizations we could make about children's early language. So before big data became a thing, it turns out that child language researchers were interested in big data. In fact, way back in the 70s, a couple of pioneering researchers developed the Child Language Data Exchange. They were mimeographing transcripts of kids' talk and sending them to whoever needed them to do their doctoral thesis. So that was open data, that was open science, and big data, and data sharing, all before those kinds of things became mainstream. And now child, the Child Language Data Exchange, or CHILDS, is actually uh, a database that archives language data from kids all over the world. And it's been cited thousands of times and formed the basis for an entire subfield of work on child language. So they were uh, an inspiration. So child, childless tells us about what kids say and what they hear, but it doesn't tell us the totality of what kids know about language. Uh, so inspired by this, a group based in San Diego, now about 20, 25 years ago, started thinking about how they might measure children's language. Again, thinking about uh, the kind of variability between kids and the need to get bigger data sets. And they developed something called the MacArthur Bates Communicative Development Inventories. It's actually originally called the MacArthur. Uh, but Liz Bates, who sadly passed away, uh, you know, sort of during the development process, actually was one of the major inspirations for, the, for this forum. So uh, it leverages a simple insight, which as parents we all can get behind. Um, we're experts in our own kids. We may not be experts in language, but we know our own kids. And we can be sensitive observers of our own kids if we're given a good chance. So the uh, CDI, as it's called, the Communicative Development Inventory, is a series of checklists or forms that researchers give to parents they ask them to take a quiet moment and think about their child's language and answer a series of simple questions like, does your child say baba? How about choo choo? How about cockadoodle doo? How about grr? And so forth and so on, going down uh, hundreds of items to try to get a picture of the totality of children's vocabulary. Now, for a, a five year old like I have, that's not really possible. I don't know all the words that my daughter Madeline knows. But for a one-year-old and sometimes a two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old, you really can sum up most of their knowledge in this kind of checklist. And studies that try to validate this measure actually show that it's a surprisingly good measure of kids' early language. That's because early language is on display all the time when you're interacting with your kid. You're seeing the words they use. You're celebrating often when they say a new thing or are able to learn a word or able to express a new thought. And so you really can concurrently report really pretty well on what your child does. What's more, these are a great research tool uh, for researchers, for clinicians. You can screen kids for language delays, and more about that in a moment. Uh, and so they've been adapted, not just to these five or six languages, but actually to more than 100 languages around the world. So researchers have developed their own version with the word list that they think is right for kids learning their native language, and then administered those surveys to hundreds, sometimes thousands of kids in their context in order to establish norms for what language development typically looks like in their culture or uh, language. So that was the state of things about five years ago when I started talking with my collaborator, Virginia Marchman. And I said, hey, all those norming data sets, Virginia, uh, do you know what happens to them? And she said, well, I have a bunch of them on my computer. Because uh, she, she had helped, and she was part of the original development team and had helped in some of these efforts. And I said, well, can I have them? She said, I don't know. We should probably ask the developers. So we started a project to get these data sets from all of these different countries, uh, from all these different academics who are developing forums all over the world. And we started a website uh, and a database and started to archive these data and make them freely available for people in a site we called WordBank. The idea was that by taking all of these data and putting them together in a single unified format, we could explore them. We could browse them, we could make them available to people, and really we could get a sense of what children's language looked like, not just in English, and not just for the couple of kids that we measure in our own study, but for thousands of kids. So here's the part where I switch to uh, the live demo, and we'll see how this works for you guys. Um, let's see if I can get it over here. So this is WordBank now live on the internet. Uh, you can go on your phone or on your computer and uh, browse around. If you do that now, I'll notice because the server's not so good and it'll probably slow down. Uh, but um, we're working on that one. Uh, so you can see that, that WordBank now has data from 75,000 different kids. Uh, 
uh, there's a huge British English sample, Norwegian English, uh, so American, Danish, Portuguese, Turkish, Mandarin, Korean, Spanish, uh, Beijing Mandarin, um, Taiwanese Mandarin, Russian, Slovak, Australian English, Swedish, and so forth. Lots of different languages, lots of different projects and researchers contributed here. And so you really get a sense of what kind of global effort this is when you look at all of the different researchers who've contributed here, far more than I could possibly name. People uh, giving us as many as 3,000 different, uh, um, different uh, data points, and people contributing as many, just a small handful, maybe 80. Uh, so this is a really a, a collective effort. And what we've done is bind these things together in a format where we can explore them. As part of that, we actually provide some exploration tools, which are kind of fun to play with, even if you're a parent or interested person uh, and just want to mess around. So he here are uh, the data that I was showing you as that messy variability uh, before in the background of my slide. So this is the data from kids learning English learn in, the, in the US from 16 months to 30 months, to about two and a half. At two and a half, we kind of say, you know, um, we're not sure if the parents know exactly what the kids know at that point. But by two and a half, um, we're doing pretty well. We can ask 680 different checklist items, and kids do pretty well. Uh, so um, this is the size of the productive vocabulary, and you can see the uh, 90th percentile is rising really fast. The 10th percentile is rising more slowly. Uh, we've got a median here. And you can ask questions about this. So for example, you might want to know about um, girls and boys. Uh, so uh, my first child is, is a girl. My second child is a boy. I'm wondering, could, what are the gender differences here? So um, I could break these down by the median and see, oh, OK. Uh, looks like the girls have an advantage in English. I wonder if they, preschool teachers, uh, and probably anybody who's observed a preschool classroom, like, yeah, yes, that's true. That's right. Um, but uh, is that true in Croatian? Yeah, it seems like it's true in Croatian. Uh, how about German? Yep, yeah, the girls are winning. Um, how about uh, Korean? Mm -hmm. even, even bigger? So this is the kind of thing that you can do here. And of course, uh, we're limited by the set of data that are collected. These are all de-identified data. So uh, we don't know a lot about each of these points. But uh, we can still make some pretty interesting generalizations, hopefully. Uh, and we can also look at this at the level of individual words. So we can plot the career of a word like baba, um, which most self-respecting 30-month-olds uh, 30 uh, 30 say. Um, but uh, you know, we can look at table, which is a little harder, or alligator. Uh, these are kind of harder words. Or uh, mommy, that's going to be a lot easier. right? So um, we can start to dig into these words. And maybe we might even want to compare them to a language um, well, uh, like here's cro uh, crocodile in German. Uh, do American kids say, croc uh, say alligator before um, German kids say crocodile? This is an interesting uh, research project for a student, right? Uh, the alligator thesis. OK. Uh, and, and we can even actually dig in and do more interesting things. For example, here um, what I'm showing is a network that's made up by linking words that are semantically related, meaning related in their meaning. Um, so we can. Uh, we can start with just the words that a 12-month-old knows and gradually make our network a little bit bigger and watch as it coheres from a couple islands to something that's starting to get connected with some animals, cat, kitty, dog, duck, maybe connect it a little more uh, and see some structure start to emerge um, until we really get a, the kind of ramified lexical network um, that characterizes an older child's understanding of the world and understanding of these concepts. And so this is a tool that we can use for lots and lots of different things. Um, so let me show you a few of the things that I think we've learned from working with this tool. So, so in the remainder of this talk, I want to share some generalizations that we've made about kids' early language. Uh, we'll start at the beginning and characterize kids' first words. Uh, and it turns out that kids' first words are surprisingly consistent across languages. I would have expected, uh, it, I did expect, that kids learning different languages would say different things first. But it turns out that babies like the same stuff, uh, as I'll show you. Uh, second, across children and across cultures and contexts, variability is a constant. Kids, as I've said, take different routes into language. And we need to acknowledge that variability as educators, uh, as policymakers, and as parents. Third, uh, I'll get a little bit into the linguistics here and suggest that there is a noun bias in early language, that kids like simple things that they can name, mostly objects, animals, people. 
Um, but interestingly, there's a, a differences between different languages in whether kids talk about actions earlier or not, verbs and occasionally adjectives. And finally, uh, I'll suggest that the growth of grammar, the ability to connect words together into these meaningful sentences uh, according to the rules of your language, that's actually very tightly linked to vocabulary growth, which gives us a little bit of a clue into the kinds of generalizations that kids are making as they learn their native language. So uh, before we get into this, I want to make a distinction that we use here a lot. Um, just so you know, um, we ask parents two different kinds of questions. We ask them sometimes if their kids understand something, which we call comprehension. And we also ask them if their child says and understands it, which we summarize as production. I'm mostly going to be talking about the says part of it today, production. Uh, and, and here's Madeline, uh, my daughter at 12 months. Uh, and she didn't say a lot at that point. She said ba, da, and ma. Um, da meant I'm excited about something. Uh, ba, I think, was ball or bottle. And ma was mom, maybe. And then she, there, there was a brilliant moment when she said ya, yeah, which meant yes. And she didn't have no yet, so she could just fail to say yes, which was just a delightful stage. That, that lasted a couple weeks. Um, but at this time, uh, under the surface, she actually, I believe, understood a lot more uh, than she said. I, I checked off on the, uh, the questionnaire at the time that she said she understood hi, bye, ball, dog, more, milk, mommy, daddy, hand, foot, nose, bath, diaper, and many others. So under the surface there, her comprehension was very rich. Uh, in fact, so rich that it gets very hard to measure. Because I don't know whether she knew the word under. Uh, hard, to, hard to tell with a 12-month-old if she knows the word under. And uh, there are laboratory procedures where we could try to ask complicated questions about precisely what words kids understand. But here, we're going to focus on this thing that we can observe, which is what comes out of their mouth. We are going to say, though, if they say it however they say it, they don't have to say ball. They can say ba. They don't have to say giraffe. That's hard. They could say raff, uh, nana, or banana. Um, so production of any type is fine, as long as it carries the meaning that we want. OK, so uh, then spoken language emerges right around the first birthday. It turns out about 80% of kids will have produced a first word of some type that their parents recognize by the first birthday. Not every kid. Don't despair if it doesn't happen with your child. This discrete point of emergence is not actually as discrete as you might think. And it's not, uh, you don't have to worry if it's 13 or 14 months. Um, and th this is true for all the languages that we study. In, in, typically, in these plots that I show, colors will be uh, language. Uh, so what do these first words look like? Well, it turns out, as I said, they look quite similar. So here's the top 10 words um, for 10-ish languages here. In Croatian, it's uh, first words are grandmommy, mommy, daddy, bye, child's name, grandpa, woof, cat, vroom, and yum yum, of course, translated into English. In Danish, it's peekaboo, patty cake, child's name, daddy, mommy, no, yum, yum, hi, bye, ouch. These all are like candidates for the first words. Maybe if they're not in the top 10, they're in the top 20 everywhere. So I've bolded the ones that show up in more than four or five languages. And you can see many of the languages have most of the words bold, uh, whether it's Turkish with mommy, daddy, yum, yum, water, <laughs> child's name, baby food, ball. They, they're all the stuff that babies care about. So babies' priorities seem to be quite similar. They're not identical across countries, but these words reflect an interest in the people around them, the small objects and animals around them, and especially those social routines that let them start to engage. Pick me up. No, don't do that. Don't give me that. Uh, hi, bye. These kinds of peekaboo, patty cake, these kinds of games and routines that let them engage with the social world. These are the key things that they want to express. Uh, and if you're interested in this topic of first words, actually, a piece just came out in The Atlantic, which features a little bit of this research, as well as a lot of other really interesting history and discussion uh, on the mystery of babies' first words, talking about this, this gradual emergence of the first thing that uh, our children say. OK, so, so the, the first words are kind of consistent across languages, but the timing and the quantity of words actually does vary a lot. So I've showed you this picture already. Uh, so this is the picture of variability across kids learning English. Um, so let's focus in on two-year-olds. Um, two is a complicated age for a lot of reasons. Um, and in terms of language, two-year-olds look like they're all over the place, right? There's some two-year-olds who are down here at the bottom who really aren't saying very much stuff at all. And there's some here who are so far up at the top of the form that their parents have literally checked all but three things. These kids are saying tons of stuff. I've known some of these two-year-olds. They're um, delightful. Uh, but, and they say a lot of things. 
So the median here is around 250, 300 words. That's the median two-year-old. But one way we can describe these data is to say that a lot of kids have a big deviation from the median. We can actually quantify the spread of these data by that deviation from the median. Uh, some kids deviate quite a lot, like these precocious kids. Uh, I also want to mention these kids who are way down here below the median, actually below the fifth percentile. Um, I won't say too much about them, but I want to note that they are late talkers. That's what we call them in the literature. That's a technical term. Um, and because kids take different routes into language, many of these kids, about half of them, typically will catch up and be just fine in a couple of years. But some of them will be manifesting speech and language disorders. And it's really important if you're a parent or an educator with a late talker, that's a two to two and a half year old who's really not saying very many words, it's important to have a chat with the pediatrician or encourage the parents to have a chat with the pediatrician. One of the key things that we look for in late talkers is if they're understanding lots of language, if they feel like they're really comprehending complex sentences and engaged, they're just not saying that many words, that's a good sign that maybe they'll catch up or maybe there's something going on with the actual process of articulation. They're having trouble saying the words. If they're having more trouble understanding, that's a good sign that it's, it's time to have a chat with a pediatrician who may refer you to a speech language specialist who can uh, try to understand a bit more of what's going on because intervening early is always a good thing when there's a speech language disorder. It helps kids catch up and uh, figure out what's going on. OK, so, so kids are, in general, though, are all over the place, especially at this two-year mark where really everything is, is possible. Uh, and we can quantify that by looking at the deviation from the median. So let's take that number, the deviation from the median, and let's summarize it across all the languages we have. We could ask, hey, th you know, these are data from the entire United States. Things are really variable here. You know, there's some kids growing up in poor uh, environments, and uh, some kids are growing up in very enriched, wonderful environments. You know, some kids are growing up with one parenting style or another parenting style. All kinds of different things are happening. Maybe that's the source of our variability. On that hypothesis, if we look at a context where more things are the same, we might see less variability between kids. Here's what the data show. There's not less variability between kids anywhere in the world. It turns out the world around, toddlers are all over the place with respect to language. So it's kind of hard to get a good flavor for what this sort of variability means. So I tried to, to sum it up um, for what you might expect as a parent if language is variable. So walking is not that variable as a parent. What that means is that um, you expect your kid to walk around one year. And the range is really only about two to three months uh, in the typical range. So uh, here's Madeline at 12 months. That's when she walked. I wouldn't have been that surprised if she walked at 14 months. And that would be the basic range. On the other hand, language is way more variable. If you're talking about saying 200 words, there's a six to 12 month range. Uh, when a kid could be able to say two, uh, uh, 200 words. Madeline could have said 200 words as early as 18 months or sometimes even earlier for precocious kids. She's just a little baby. She's barely walking that well. But there's some kids that are already talking up a storm. She was actually right in the middle. She said 200 words just a little before 24 months. She's kind of a full-fledged little toddler, preschooler guy here. And then uh, she could very easily have typically been uh, saying them as late as 30 months. That would have been within the typical range, and she would have been you know, in her preschool class having transferred over already and really you know, making friends and interacting. Uh, so there's just a huge range that we should expect in the range of normal variation. And that variability is very interesting, and that's really what we're going to focus on uh, for the rest of my talk. OK, so, so just because it's variable doesn't mean we can't predict some of it. And as I said, some of it is very predictable from biological sex. Uh, female versus male. So uh, you don't even have to know what countries these are because the pattern is just about all the same. Uh, in nearly all of these graphs, 25 out of 26 or something like this, um, maybe we added one recently, uh, the uh, blue line for females is above the red line for males and almost to about the same degree. It's very consistent across countries that girls are slightly better at language than boys. Not tremendously better, but on average, you know, noticeably better, the kind of thing so that if you have a girl, you expect them to be a little bit faster. Uh, as uh, the writer Emily Oster says, um, if, if you have a girl first and then you have a boy, you start thinking, what's wrong with your boy? If you have a boy first and you have the girl, then you think, my girl's a genius. <laughs> uh, so um, so here, here's my son Jonah. He's four months old. Um, I'm, I'm not worried about his disadvantage yet, but we'll, we'll see what, what crops up. Um, on that note, though, 
birth order also has a predictable effect on language. Uh, here are the English data. Um, blue firstborn is a bit higher than yellow for secondborn is a bit higher for thirdborn and below. Um, so now Jonah's doubly disadvantaged. <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll see what happens, but um, I'm sure he'll be fine. Uh, and we, uh, we see that this pattern is also extremely consistent across languages. Again, these aren't huge effects, but there really are these differences, and it helps us predict what's going on with, with uh, kids' outcomes. Uh, a slightly sadder uh, pattern, which we also observe across uh, countries and contexts, is that maternal education, the mom's education, um, which is a pretty good proxy for socioeconomic status, when you compare across countries, you can't really compare variables like income, because income really varies a lot between countries. But if you look at uh, how many years of education the mom has, that's a pretty decent proxy that you can look at. And what we see is that uh, if you've only completed, uh, um, if you haven't completed secondary education, your kids tend to have a smaller vocabulary uh, than if you complete secondary, college, and above. And, and these vocabularies are not big. This is the general r rate of growth. Uh, that we're worried about, because we're worried that kids with smaller vocabularies are going to have trouble when they hit school. Uh, so um, one of the interesting but worrisome things about this graph is that we actually see that the differences are different across countries. So um, if we uh, look at some of the Scandinavian social democracies, so Norwegian um, or Danish kids, that spread between different levels of education is actually quite low. In contrast, if you look at um, the US, for example, um, or um, Mexico, um, you see bigger levels of stratification. You see bigger differences. And that suggests that that's a real policy target for us, that there may be things about the way we handle early childhood education, parent leave, um, and other aspects of policy that may have real consequences for these differences. Uh, in fact, uh, these differences are the focus of a lot of recent interventions here in the US, Providence Talks, or. Um, the New York intervention uh, and advertising program to encourage talk to kids. Uh, and um, in the UK, uh, some really interesting intervention work, the Newfield Early Language Intervention. So there are lots of people trying to focus on these differences and figure out how we can actually intervene on the language to kids to make sure that they're getting what they need in order to learn. Um, and, and just to delve into this a little bit, it's outside of the scope of our data, but it's an important topic. Um, the general consensus that's coming out of, of work in this area is that the quality of the words that kids hear rather than the quantity is what really matters. And that lines right up with some of the work that I've done here at Bing, where uh, my experimental work has focused on getting these kind of grounded situations where uh, a caregiver and a child are talking about objects and they both are sharing attention in this dance where they both know what they're talking about and they're engaged. Uh, and that presents the best kind of learning opportunity. So that's what we mean when we say quality, is those interactions that are really focused around things that the child understands, a game, a routine, a toy, uh, an object, an experience, that lets them really dig into language and interact and learn. So that's, that's the kind of m what we think of as the microstructure of child language. When we're, what we're looking at here mostly is the macro structure, the big stuff, like how big your vocabulary is. Uh, these are the little bits and pieces that accrete, that aggregate over the course of a lifetime of interacting with a caregiver, going to a care environment, a school, a daycare, um, being with a nanny, and really uh, create the language background that children bring to them when they start school. OK, um, so, so let's, let's dig into the next little bit. Um, I, I promised I'd tell you about a bias for nouns, about kids liking concrete things. So what does that mean to be biased for nouns? Um, well, uh, here's a graph that kind of demonstrates this. What we're looking at is kids with different vocabulary sizes, from uh, just getting started all the way up to an expert. Uh, and here's the curve for how much of that vocabulary is made up of nouns. So this area here, this kind of curve upward, that bow reflects the fact that, especially when kids know 100, 200, 300 words, too many of them are nouns. Too many, I don't know. More of them are nouns than you'd expect if they were just learning words randomly. And fewer of them are verbs. They're, and you think about any kid that you've probably experienced learning language, they're not going around going, look, run, look, throwing. Right? They're, that's not the, the way it works. They're going ball, dog, shoe, you know bird, plane, right there are pointing to things. And that's, uh, that's part of this. So one question that we might ask that's really interesting from the perspective of understanding how language learning works is, 
is this every kid everywhere, or is this English? Is this about the structure of English? Because throwing is not a kind of thing we say in English. We say, the boy is throwing the ball. We don't just go, throwing. Uh, it turns out that um, this noun bias, it's generally positive in just about every language you look at, but it does vary. And it varies in some interesting ways. So up at the top here, we've got German, Danish, English, Korean also, interestingly, Norwegian. But a lot of these um, you know, uh, Germanic languages, uh, language, European languages are up there. Um, and when we look at verbs, we see um, there's a lot of variation. And the, but the most interesting thing is that uh, the uh, Mandarin and Cantonese um, Chinese languages actually have a positive verb bias. So uh, look walking is actually a thing that I'm told you can say um, very naturally uh, in Mandarin. Uh, in contrast, in English um, or in Danish, where you have to say, there, look, there's a dog use walking. You have to have a subject um, for your verb. You can't drop out the subject. You can't just name actions that are happening in the same natural way. And that difference between the languages does seem to have a consequence for the kids who are learning. So kids do like con concrete objects in general. But the structure of the language that you're learning influences the kinds of words that you learn. So what are these nouns that kids are learning, um, that they're biased to learn? Here are some of the categories that we look at on the CDI. And these plots are a little tricky, but you can just think of them uh, as uh, sort of showing which languages have a preference for which things. So if a, if a curve is kind of bowed up, if it goes above the diagonal line, that's a preference for the thing. So this is sounds. And just about every language, except for this weird one, um, which I think is Russian, uh, uh, just about every language, babies like uh, onomatopoeia. They like the sounds of things. Grr, woof, woof, choo, choo. These are fun. They're fun words to say. They're easy to learn. They sound like the thing that you're learning. Uh, kids also like, think, as I've said uh, earlier, games and routines. Um, and one of the really powerful routines for language learning is dinner time, is meal time. So here's Madeline uh, engaging in um, a routine that leaves her a little bit messy. Uh, and learning words for food and drink. Animals, of course, kids love, right? Uh, so uh, all of these uh, lines that group together suggest that these are patterns that are seen across languages. Kids in nearly every language you looked at seem to like animals. Kids in just about every language you look at learn body parts way earlier than they might be expected to, just based on their frequency or based on uh, kind of the other words that are around. Body parts are easy to learn. They're fun. You're playing. Um, you're playing, you know, uh, can you, can you uh, see your hands? Or you're playing um, uh, the one piggy, two piggy with your toes. These are kind of great interactive routines that let kids learn. Then way down here on the bottom, what don't kids learn? What are the, the nouns? What are the words that kids aren't interested in, aside from abstract words like fairness and justice? Um, well, it turns out there's other things that are kind of abstract that we talk about all the time, like time words. Um, here's a quote from Madeline at 33 months. She said, my baby really sick. And um, uh, her mom said, oh, yeah? What happened? She said, my baby spit up three times last year and 79 times last night. <laughs> so clearly, she knows something about time. But she doesn't know everything about time yet. And it turns out time is conceptually really hard for kids. And you don't see them learning these words that often. So uh, really, when we're talking about kind of quality language input, it's, it's language that really um, works in the here and now and really emphasizes these things like uh, body parts, like vehicles, like animals, the stuff that you can really uh, engage a child with. OK. Uh, the last little bit I want to tell you about is children learning to combine words. So this is an observation. This is a, due to Liz Bates, who uh, was a, one of the developers of the CDI. Um, she uh, plotted out kids' vocabulary, again, so from a small vocabulary to a large vocabulary. And she plotted uh, also their grammatical abilities, their ability to combine words in uh, more complex ways. Uh, and what she found is that these two things were surprisingly related to one another. So in other words, the bigger your vocabulary, the more likely you were to say the more complex thing. Uh, so uh, a kid with a small vocabulary might say doggy table. One with a larger vocabulary would say doggy on table. A smaller vocabulary might say that's my truck, that my truck, leaving out the little morpheme there versus that's my truck. Or baby crying versus just the more complex sentence, baby crying because she's sad. It turns out across all the languages we've looked at, these two things are really directly related. The more words you know, 
the stronger your ability to combine them. Now, why is that? I think it gives you a little bit of a clue to how kids make generalizations, bringing us back to Madeline trying to figure out how to put words together. Right? The more words you know, the more ways you can try to put them together, and the better you can generalize. So here's Madeline at 17 months. Uh, mama no go work. Dada no go work. Madeline no go daycare. Grandma me no go airplane. Right? She's kind of working out what we call a construction, a way of putting words together to make meaning. Um, of course, what is she describing here? Uh, this is the weekend. And all that stuff happens. So having learned this about the noun bias, having learned this about grammar and vocabulary, we're now in a position to actually come back to this idea of children being variable. And it turns out when we look back at the data, we can now describe a little bit of these different roots into language. So it turns out that the, there is this spread of different trajectories, different ways that kids learn, some slower, some a little bit faster. Um, and they're characterized in really interesting and different ways that come out in the data. Uh, in particular, some of these kids who are younger, who are talking more, who are talking up a storm, um, there's a label that's been given to them, which is they're referential kids. And this actually characterizes them pretty well. They know more names. They tend to be more nouny, noun biased. They, they're just kind of walking around picking up the names of stuff. And they tend to combine those words a little bit less. In contrast, some of these slightly slower kids, they're knowing fewer nouns. They're a little bit older. Um, but they're actually more expressive. They're combining words more fluently. Their sentences are longer and more complicated, even though they don't have as big a vocabulary. And these seem like they're kind of fundamentally different strategies that kids are taking. Uh, these were first documented uh, by Katherine Nelson in her observation of just a small number of kids where she really noticed tightly, some of these kids look like they're doing something different. And sure enough, it turns out this structure pops out in nearly every language that we see, that there are these differences between referential kids uh, and expressive kids. All right, so just, just to review uh, what I've said here, I showed you a ton of graphs, uh, but hopefully uh, you got a little bit of, of the flavor for what we do. And uh, what I tried to argue is that first words are very consistent across languages. Across children, variability is just a constant. Kids are all over the place with respect to language. Uh, and uh, one consistency that we do see is this noun bias. And that ca characterizes one aspect of the variability between kids. Some kids are nounier. They're more interested in naming objects. Finally, the growth of grammar is linked to vocabulary growth. And I hope now you're convinced that bigger data sets, like the one we're trying to gather here, can help us understand human development. So as we go onward, the CDI is not the starting place or the ending place for studying language. It's a way station along the way. We use these questionnaires. They tell us something. But we're starting to use more detailed measures as well. So we're bringing kids into our lab uh, here in Palo Alto. We're also bringing kids um, into a collaborator's lab in Hong Kong. And we're using head-mounted cameras, seen here, uh, through the lens of the mom's head-mounted camera to really characterize what's going on. Uh, and we're trying to use these to help us inform the kind of technical models that actually model kids' exploration and learning uh, in, in the process of playing and interacting with other people. We're also trying to branch out beyond the questionnaire, beyond the checklist. Um, so we've got a brand new app called Wordful up in the iOS app store if you're interested. Uh, you can download it and track your child's vocabulary in real time. Uh, now you can swipe words left or swipe right to let us know. Yeah, I, I'm told that's a popular user interface. Uh, uh, to let us know if, if your child is uh, beginning to say dog or ball. Uh, so in all these ways, we're trying to bring data to bear on this fundamental question. Uh, and I hope you leave thinking that this question is really something that not only is at the heart of trying to understand technical development as you interact with your phones and the devices around you, it's also really at the heart of child development. So thank you very much for having me. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the supporters, uh, notably a Bing alum, uh, the, the Joe Fund for Language and Cognition, as well as the National Science Foundation and the Jacobs Foundation. And uh, thank you to you guys for having me. Happy to take some questions as well. Yeah, please.
Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, so there are two different cases we could be talking about. One is uh, what we might call sort of early bilingualism, kids learning two languages simultaneously. And then the other is maybe se uh, late bilingualism or second language learning uh, as a child is adding a second language um, on top of the first. Um, so unfortunately, this data set tells us relatively little about those because uh, the developers of a lot of these forms were very interested in children's uh, normative growth in their own language. So like, what, what does it look like to typically learn Norwegian? Uh, but people are starting to increasingly come around and realize the fact that most of the world's children are actually growing up not monolingual, bilingual, trilingual in many cases. Uh, and so that, that poses a challenge for this kind of assessment. You have to figure out how to uh, put together the data from two different forms. And, and folks are starting to do that and starting to say, well, what's typical when, you've got, when you're learning uh, English and another language? And um, some of the words overlap and some of them don't. Um, so you've got some number of concepts that you've learned and some number of words that you've learned, and those don't exactly line up. So that's where this work is going. And it, it's going there, I think, in a very interesting way. Uh, and so, so more or less what we see with bilingual acquisition is that it looks pretty similar, actually. Um, kids are surprisingly good. It takes them a second, but then they sort out which language, it, which language is which. And their vocabulary grows at about the same speed uh, in terms of the total number of concepts they learn. Now, that could be, uh, if, if the languages overlap a lot, um, they may look like they, uh, they sort of have uh, different size vocabularies in different uh, languages. But if you add up what the things they actually know how to say, um, they track pretty well with one another uh, for the monolinguals and the bilinguals. Is it whether they both do that with other Yeah, yeah. For second language acquisition, um, you know, I, I know less. Th that's more, um, there are a lot, there's a lot of research on how to teach kids, especially in a school context, a second language. And, uh, often that's a much more explicit process of instruction, um, pretty uh, different than the kind of natural, implicit learning that happens when children play and acquire their first language. Yeah, that's a cool phenomenon. Um, I, you know, I, what I think is really interesting, I, I would guess, if they're, you know, these younger kids um, are in the preschool range, they probably are speaking the right language in the right place to the right people, but they don't know that there are two things called languages that are named in this way. So one is the ability to use it, and the other is um, what we call the metacognition, the knowing that you know these things. And I, I think one of the lovely things about children's uh, view of the social world is they don't see it as separated, as bifurcated, as divided as we do, right? So kids don't notice even that people have different genders uh, for quite a number of years. And then often for a couple of years after that, they don't notice that there are different races. They're not breaking down the world into this language, this skin color, this uh, gender in the same way as they, they do learn it. They, they, they figure this out. But especially in the preschool age, there's a real openness. And so even though they're you know, speaking in one language at home and another language at school, they're not necessarily even assuming that you don't know that or uh, he doesn't speak that one, which I think is quite cool. I love it. I love it. This is this is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night. And I and this is this is why um you know uh, at least 60% of the book uh, that I that contains all of these data is kind of um, undigestible masses of graphs because we're desperately trying to figure that out. So I I don't know the the precise answer, but I'll tell you a couple things that that comfort me. So um one you know. Uh, one of the things that you naturally worry about when you see something, for example, like the gender disparities that we see, you think, well, what are parents' stereotypes of boys versus girls? Are they just thinking the girls know more words, or do the girls actually know more words? 
Uh, and so we, in that particular case, we can go to other methods for measurement um, that are, have been done very reliably. You can bring the kids into the lab and uh, ask them to point to things. You can measure their language uh, in a naturalistic play session. You can do all these things that are different methods, and the, uh, the measurements converge really very nicely to a gender difference that's about the same size. Now, you might ask about the socioeconomic differences. Is the same thing true there? Uh, there, we have less data. Um, but the data that we have actually, you know, in some cases they go the opposite direction. We see sometimes, uh, we see sometimes underreporting, but we also see overreporting as well um, by socioeconomic status. So we see we see some variability in lower socioeconomic status reporters because they're not sure what we're asking, or they're doing this at a moment that's difficult, or maybe the instructions haven't been given in a way that are easy to understand. So there is more noise in those groups, and there regrettably are fewer data from especially um, extremely low socioeconomic status folks in here. Most of these are still kind of pretty uh, base middle class families. But, uh, but there is some variability that's due to that, and quantifying that is one of the things that we're actually actively working on. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So, so it, it, it certainly has been done. So he, here's the question is, um, you know, uh, if you ask a mom and dad this questionnaire, you know, it does correlate. But actually, they know different words that the kid knows, right? Because dad takes the kid to the zoo, mom takes the kid to school or whatever, right? There, there are different aspects of the vocabulary that they, uh, they can both be right, in other words. Um, so that, that correlation is about 0.6. Um, if you give... Um, dad the, the, the questionnaire now, and then dad the questionnaire in a month, it's about 0.8, or maybe even 0.9 in some studies. So it's very closely related. But you know, as you go longer, the vocabulary is actually shifting. So the words that you know are different, and so the correlation goes down. So you know, one thing you can ask about these kind of data is, is what else could we be doing? Uh, is there something that we could have done better rather than using the questionnaire? And, and there, the striking answer is not really. Um, so these, you know, these questionnaires aren't perfect. They're kind of a starting point rather than an ending point. But it turns out if you're trying to measure a two-year-old, the last thing you want to do is bring them into a lab and get a weird guy with a beard trying to ask them about the meaning of the word alligator. Like, I could get, you know, four or five, maybe ten questions in as a skilled experimenter, and then the two-year-old is out the door, you know, running down the hall, and we're all chasing after them. So uh, um, it, it is actually surprisingly tricky to, to get an assessment. So, so um, you know, I think where we are is we've got the most reliable measure of a two-year-old, which is not very reliable. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, that's, a, that's another um, area where these data are mostly lacking, unfortunately, that when uh, people try to put together these sorts of normative data sets, what they see, you know, they actually uh, exclude cases of atypical development because they're interested in uh, normative variations so that they, then they can screen for uh, atypical language outcomes. Um, but that's, that's regrettable because there's actually a lot of really interesting stuff that we can learn by looking at how vocabulary is different. So we're just starting to, to partner with some folks who are autism experts because they are the, there's some real interesting differences in vocabulary that might give clues about uh, individual kids or the uh, um, spectrum as a whole and how their language varies. Yeah, um, the, the longer you go out, the, um, the harder it is to get those kinds of data. But uh, everything we have suggests that language ability is actually quite stable uh, across the lifespan. So um, there are a couple different studies that have looked at this. Um, one influential one only goes to, um, maybe, you know, if you look between two-year-olds and four-year-olds, there's really tight correlations. Uh, as you go uh, out to school age, Anne Fernald has looked at that, and you get pretty good correlations. Um, and some, uh, some uh, twin studies that have looked at twins and the relationship between their language have actually gone out further, and they see uh, quite, quite decent correlations even out into adolescence, I believe. So um, 
there's a sense that there's a trajectory that uh, kids are on that's in part determined by home environment, part determined by uh, the kind of uh, ecosystem outside the home, their culture, their schooling, uh, and in part determined by internal factors, by their genetics. Yeah, I, I think I, I would go back um, not not to these data as much as to um, some of the other experiments that we've done um, where we really investigate what the factors are that help kids learn a word in a specific interaction. Um, so uh, the elements of an interaction that we know that are positive are that it's grounded around uh, objects um, or uh, kind of events that the child can see and that the child knows that we're both talking about, um, that it includes a rich set of social cues, including pointing, eye gaze, gesture, so both uh, people, both parties are involved, um, that it's extended, it's not just a one-off comment, but it really engages over time, so it's a discourse, so it's lots of uh, uh, turn-taking and interaction back and forth. Uh, for older kids, it can involve questions and explanatory language. Uh, so uh, saying things like, that's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a chihuahua is a kind of dog. That's what this is. Could you see the chihuahua? Do you see the parts? Do you see the way it interacts? So you're giving a, a rich description. Uh, these are the sorts of things that tend to bring higher quality to the interactions and that are associated with uh, better learning in the moment and that when parents do them are associated with uh, parents having kids with bigger vocabularies. So the, the interventions, that, you know, there are relatively few interventions that are really, even have been tested uh, once, let alone many times, and shown to uh, affect child language. But a lot of the ones that do focus on ways that you can increase the quality of interaction. So um, a classic one is uh, book reading interventions, which create those moments where we're both looking at this, and we've got some you know, complex, elaborate language, and um, we're really uh, in, the, you know, in a longer interaction that gives many opportunities for learning. So uh, there is a sort of a limited amount of data about this early baby sign. So the idea, you know, you, te you teach your child um, more or milk or some of these signs. Uh, my impression of what little data there are is that uh, there are no negative effects, um, but also um, not any clear kind of positive effects. I think it would be a big deal if there was a clear positive effect and it's sort of unlikely a priori. Um, what it does do, at least um, in these sort of small studies that I've seen, uh, is uh, make things slightly easier for the parents, right? It's, which is not nothing. A lot of early parenting interventions aren't about making the kid, you know, healthier and wealthier uh, and wiser at, at age 20. They're about kind of making life better right now, and and, and that's not nothing. Um, I know as a parent of a four-month-old, right? If he could tell me my diaper is wet, that would be great, right? So. Um, you know, I, I think that that's the primary function of these uh, very early communicative signs. Um, they might, one, one note about them though, um, early signing actually can um, be a manifestation of uh, a general early gesture, and early gesture is actually really very positive for language. So, so kids um, putting together gestures and words, doing a lot of declarative pointing, doing a lot of, you know, pick me up or give me that, those kinds of gestures are a way that kids who can't necessarily say the words yet are uh, you expressing themselves. And, and that's a sign, and, and it seems to be related to kind of later language going well. I think anything that's fun, you know, honestly. Um, wh so what's a six-month-old learning? Um, what's going on right at that moment is a couple different things. One is they're getting accustomed to the sounds of the words uh, and of the individual um, phonemes, the little minimal units of sound in English. So they're learning about the way English distinguishes, you know, uh, 
ta versus ka, but not ta versus ta, which, you know, a la language like Hindi, if I spoke it, that, those would sound like different sounds to me, maybe. Uh, right, so, so they're kind of gradually fleshing out that understanding of what English sounds like. And they're also, um, my father-in-law is actually a speech pathologist, and he calls it, he, they're playing the instrument, right? They're trying out what their vocal apparatus and their mouth and their tongue, what all of that working together can do. Um, and so uh, by interacting, you're kind of encouraging that exploration. And by, by uh, saying, you know, anything that you say is going to sound a lot like language. Uh, and so by making sounds back, you're encouraging that turn taking with them. And you're also modeling what a ba sounds like. If you're saying ba, 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 you, you say it like an English speaker is saying ba, ba, ba. And so um, it, what it moves them away from is a lot of the non language things that, that uh, little babies do when they're first starting to vocalize. They go, Grr. Uh, uh, right, they're, they're making all these very odd noises that are distinct from language uh, because they're playing the instrument. They're just trying out what, what noises you can make when you strum up the top and down at the bottom. And so, so by, um, by kind of interacting and motivating and encouraging, you're doing kind of everything that you, you should be. The more fun it is, the more you do it, and the more they'll like it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't worry about it. I, th I think ba if, if if he likes it when you say "ba" back, go for it. I mean, my, my four-month-old, what he really likes it is when I go back. So I do that, and he laughs, and it's amazing. Um, so yeah, um, like there's a, um, what, what a group at Harvard calls it is serve and return. Um, you're playing this game with them, and that's teaching them about the way interaction works. And you're making sounds from English, whether or not they're complex words, and that's. Uh, teaching them something. You know, I, when uh, your son wants uh, more complex input, he'll be actually making offers that require that. So a thing that we find is that when kids start to locomote, and especially when they start to walk, they can offer things up to you that require you to say something, oh, yeah, that's a, or no, put that back, right? Um, so the, the things that a slightly older infant can elicit from you are the right things. They're more complex. And the things that a baby elicits are mostly like, <laughs> You know, and you do that, and that's fun too. So I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. So, so the ability of, of uh, little kids to figure out and become trilingual is just astonishing, right? Like, if I could do that trick and you could say those things to me and I could become trilingual and I would do it in a second, right? Um, I think, you know, there are some folks recommend um, the sort of one parent, one language kind of strategy, which there's maybe a little evidence that can you know, speed up the process of figuring out which is which. But uh, what's remarkable is, is just sort of hearing this mix of sound, your, your child will kind of figure out what are the sound patterns of one and the sound patterns of another. And there will probably be a period of confusion, um, which just sounds like I, you know, saying one thing that maybe is kind of between languages. But um, by two, two and a half, um, you, they're going to start to diverge. And uh, you know, the, the typical outcome is that things work out really nicely. So, so, uh, a lot of parents worry about confusing their kids with bilingual input, but in fact, that may be the way most kids learn, right? Um, I did some research in India a number of years ago, and I was just amazed at how the assumption was that there was going to be a different language for different family members, different interactions, different kinds of uh, uh, contexts, and that was just fine. And the kids were learning five languages in the course of their daily life. so. <laughs> because we cannot follow that like one person, one language. So, so now like my, my, my younger son is like very slow uh, to for language. And I was just curious about for you, like you said, your second uh, first order is a big benefit. Because in, in my common sense, it should be a benefit because I think he's kind of like exposed to more uh, language requirements. So I'm just curious why the you know, second first would be a big benefit. 
Yeah, um, well, so uh, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll try to answer that question and then tell you one case where, where uh, later siblings are actually advantaged. So, so here's, here's the theory, and I think nobody knows if this is really true, but it seems sensible. Um, what we want, you know, what we think are the best learning outcomes are these just quality interactions where you've really got a, an extended period of time talking about a particular context. And those are just going to be necessarily a little bit more rare in a two-child household and a little bit more rare still in a three and a four. Um, so the more there is, um, you know, this time for extended interaction uh, around a situation that's completely understandable, the more that drives language. Uh, and so, um, you know, the, the differences aren't huge, but there is some necessary difference. If there are two people around, you're not going to be talking to each one quite as much, at, at least as directly. Um, now, there are some things that are better to figure out if you've got an older brother or sister who's, um, who's around getting talked to. So one kind of interesting thing that first kids do is they sometimes confuse um, what uh, you means, right? They might think that you just means me because there's only one you in this house and it's me. <laughs> Right, uh, and it turns out that second-born kids don't make that mistake. They know they're not the only center of the universe. <laughs> right, so their pronouns actually are acquired a little bit faster. Anyway, that, another tidbit about second-borns actually. Uh, um, we'll see if this happens with Jonah. Um, uh, their first word is more likely to be uh, no <laughs> than uh, first-born kids. Yeah, the, the question of uh, screen time and of interactive media especially is one that I think every parent is thinking about uh, often all the time um, by necessity. Um, so the, you know, the, the evidence often lags a bit behind the technology. So a lot of the, we're just sort of making up our minds about TV when along come, comes the internet. Um, so with, with little kids, um, with, you say under two, there's pretty good evidence that it's hard for them to learn, especially from non-interactive media. It's really tough for them to get the meaning of a word from a, a television show. Um, if, uh, and if you play uh, sort of speech sounds in, in Mandarin, um, which might be exposing them to appropriate sound patterns, they don't seem to learn as much from that, uh, as opposed to interacting with somebody who's speaking Mandarin to them. Then they seem to learn the speech pattern, so uh, the, you know, the, the sound pattern. So. Um, kind of non-interactive media doesn't really work for these little kids. On the other hand, really interactive media does. So Skyping with a grandparent uh, actually uh, is an opportunity to learn. And there are some nice word learning studies that use a kind of Skype communication, uh, which I think resonates with a lot of people that, that um, video chat actually is a great way to connect. And it can be wonderful, especially for kids that, you know, like mine, aren't that good at talking on the phone. So. Uh, as kids get older, they can learn from more different contexts. And so you know, the classic studies were of Sesame Street, right? Sesame Street actually did work to teach kids some school readiness. Um, so uh, you, you know, their, their focus on colors and numbers actually helped. And you can see measurable impacts of that. Um, the expectation is that the right kinds of interactive media could have similar effects in moderation. Uh, what people always talk about in this context, though, is opportunity cost, right? What, what does it come at the expense of? Uh, if it comes at the expense of this high quality interaction, then that's not good. But if it, it comes at the expense of you know, um, half-hearted attempts to, to regulate while you cook dinner, well, you know, everybody has to cook dinner at some point. Um, so uh, you know, I'll tell you what our family does. Um, and, and, and I don't think any, any family should necessarily choose this one. But um, uh, since she was one and a half accidentally, Madeline discovered YouTube. And she immediately noticed that it was the most amazing thing that she'd ever seen. And we regretted the uh, actual accident that uh, exposed her to it. And we, after a couple months of chaos, we discovered a plan, which was that she could only watch YouTube while she had a toothbrush in her mouth. <laughs> so you know, 500 toothbrushes later, she'd brush her teeth. So, so she watches TV while she brushes her teeth and while we get ready for work. And that's when she gets to watch. And, that's not a time when we were going to have really high quality interactions with her, so we, I don't feel so bad about it. Um, I don't, you know, that's, that's the way we've made our peace with it. I, I don't have a big role for interactive apps in our, in, in our interaction. There's some that are, you know, seem fun, but I guess I think 
when I could be giving her the apps, I could also be playing, and so I often choose the play, with the exception of airplanes. This is, I think this is, you know, from talking to uh, parents of bilingual kids, this is one of the biggest challenges, right, is how to maintain that bilingual competence that the kids often have as they're starting school. Um, and that can be very challenging. Um, the advice that I've heard other bilingual parents uh, give, um, especially ones who are researchers, is to try to find contexts beyond the home where that second la or that first language uh, sometimes is uh, relevant and where it fuels interactions with peers and others so that you really maintain the competence. Um, but that said, you know, even if your kids um, aren't using Mandarin as much, uh, and they're mostly speaking English, they're still maintaining a substantial amount of what you've given them, right? And they can bring that back by, uh, by study later in life, and many of them will. Many kids will say, you know, I didn't speak Mandarin much, but now I, you know, I realize I want to communicate with my family, and I want to talk, uh, and I want to learn more about this, and I'm going to study it. And they, you know, they come into the intro language classes at Stanford, and everybody resents them because they know just about all of Mandarin, they just don't know they know it, right? So, so you're giving them a lot, and their ability to speak like a native is in part because of that early language exposure, even if they make the choice not to do it. Um, I should I should redo the, the analysis um, with a, with a personal interest there. Um, everybody says big sisters are great, right? Um, no, I, I actually I don't know the answer to that. I'll I'll, um, I'll see if we have enough data to answer that. That would be cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Regarding maintaining a bilingual environment, sorry, <laughs> with a bilingual question. So you mentioned the benefit of uh, one parent sticking to one language when there are two separate languages. But what about when both parents are equally You know, that, that kind of code switching is something that, that kids uh, learn in a lot of different cultures and a lot of contexts. And it may, there's some evidence that it might like prolong the confusion about which language is which for a little bit, but uh, they turn out fine. I, I think all the evidence suggests that they, they'll still distinguish the language and uh, then um, they're gonna also um, distinguish it from the language they learn outside of the home. Right, so, so once they're in school or in other care, uh, they get a sort of different set of language models and they can begin to kind of piece together, okay, this is one register, as it's called, one way of speaking, and here this code switching way that we do at home, that's a different way. Um, sometimes kids you know, say, well, we, we, we spoke Spanglish at home and we spoke English uh, at school. And that, that's, a, that's a way that they think about the languages. And there's, you know, maybe I speak Spanish with Abuela, but I speak Spanglish with my, you know, with my family at home. You know, co colors are amazing, actually. Uh, so if you go back to, like, 1900, um, like, no five-year-olds knew their colors. Uh, right? There, there are all these really well-documented things of, like, uh, these seven-year-olds that didn't know color terms. Um, and now, you know, most self-respecting three-year-olds are perfect at them. Many two-year-olds are good. So uh, it, it, we had, in my house, we had this, um, this nightlight that Madeline was obsessed with that if you press the button on it, it would go from green to purple uh, to orange, which are not like the first colors that kids are supposed to learn. But those were like 18 months. She would go green, purple, orange, green, 
purple, orange, all, until she fell asleep. And so there she was. So, so I, it used to be thought that colors were specifically confusing and hard. And now I think people are coming around to the fact that it's just because we didn't talk about them as much and in as clear cases. Um, and if you've got kind of blocks that are different colors, it's, that's actually quite clear. This is the green one. This is the purple one. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question and then wrap up. So, uh, yeah. so we talk about interactive. I'm very curious about the nuance behind it because we see, uh, in terms of interactive media, we see gamification, we see real, real human features, we also see It's going to be different for different ages, I think, right? So, so for um, very young kids, for um, for infants and, and preschoolers, uh, you really uh, the contingency that comes with interacting with a human or with an agent that knows that you're attending and are interested uh, is critical because. You know, as anybody who's played with a two-year-old knows, you, you really have to kind of maintain their focus and attention on the game, or they're wandering off to do something else, and that opportunity is lost. So that that contingency and and uh, what's called joint attention is really what drives the interaction. For slightly older kids, it may be that the rewarding nature of the interaction and the ability to predict it and get some kind of um, kind of uh, visual reward is is exciting and and fun and may drive things more. I, I think this is an area where. Again, the tech is moving so fast uh, that you know by the time the research catches up, the tech is so much beyond it that the research is barely relevant. So it's, it's a real challenge. Yeah. 